Good morning, and welcome to Worship in First Korean. Uh, if you're visiting with us, and I see lots of visitors this morning, you are very, very welcome. May God bless you as you do so. Let's worship God together. I am so thrilled that Rosie is with us this morning. She's had chocolate for breakfast. Really, Robin? She's had chocolate for breakfast, so she's raring to go, and uh, Rosie's going to lead us in our call to worship. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. Psalm 92, verse 1 to 2. Well done, Rosie. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's stand and sing to our risen Saviour. See what a morning. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we join with the Apostle Peter's bold declaration of living hope and great joy this day. For Jesus has risen from the dead, and this good news changes everything. Because of your resurrection, we are not afraid to die, nor are we afraid to live. We are not hapless vagabonds aimlessly wandering on the earth. We are hope-filled citizens of heaven. We are no longer enslaved to our sin. We are now wrapped in your righteousness. Thank you, Father. Because of your resurrection, we're less to be pitied than anybody and more grateful than everybody. You are the first fruits and the guarantee of a whole new creation the realm of redemption and restoration. One day, one day everything sad will come untrue and all things broken will be made new. 
Father, how we long for that day. Because of your resurrection, you reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. All evil and wickedness, all that is corrupt, now stands defeated. Things are not as they appear. You live, love, and reign over all things. You died for our sins, and you have been raised for our justification. We are fully, freely, and finally forgiven. We are loved, and we are yours. Thank you, Father. In the light of this living hope and this compelling love, this measureless grace and this in eternal inheritance that is ours, Father, will you free us to spend the rest of our days living to your glory and to your honour. For it is in Jesus' praiseworthy and powerful name that we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing of this wonderful living hope that we have in Jesus. Let's stand and praise him together. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb
We have been journeying to Easter using 1 Peter chapter 1 as our theme and looking at what Peter calls living hope. We've thought about how great it is, we've thought about what it is, and this morning we're going to see what it means for us. So turn with me to 1 Peter and chapter 1, if you would. 1 Peter chapter 1. And let's hear God's word together. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith, of, which is of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they are not serving themselves, but you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Boys and girls, although we don't have adventures this morning, I do want to talk to you, so will you come down to the front just for a moment or two, and I have something special for you this morning, if you do. It wouldn't be Easter without an Easter egg, would it? So, let's have an Easter egg. Some people like cream eggs. Do you like cream eggs? Yes. Or do you like ordinary eggs? Ordinary. Ordinary eggs. Tell me, when you eat a cream egg, how do you eat it? Do you bite the top off it first? Yeah. And then lick out the cream in? Yeah. 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 And then eat the rest of it? Yep. Yep, brilliant. That's the way I like to eat my cream eggs. How many Easter eggs have you got? One. One. That's all you need. <laughs> one is all you need. Let me tell you, one is all you need. Here we go, here we go. It's good to get a bit of chocolate on Easter Sunday, isn't it? Yep. How we? Yep. Johnny, do you want one? You. Yes, you do. I knew you did. I knew that's why you came to the front. That's why you came. Yep, absolutely. Here we go. Yes, you like that one. Good, Hannah. Good, Hannah. Well done. Everybody get one that wants one? Everybody get one? Yeah, do you want one? There we go, lads. Good. Good. Good, Holly. Anybody else want? No. Okay. Let's see. Tell me this. Do you know why we get cream eggs? 
and eggs at Easter. No? No. Yes. Yes. I don't know why there's a few left. Oh, that, somebody didn't get it. Yeah, good. We got one. Oh, you got one. You got one. Okay. I don't know why we have Easter eggs. I don't know. Yes? New birth. Yes. Talks about the new birth that Jesus offers. Yep. Anybody else? No? Yes, it, it speaks of the tomb. Yes, absolutely. And here's the thing. When I open my Easter egg, oh, anybody, anybody would like a twirl? Paul, would you like a wee twirl? There we go. Okay. Um, here's what I think of when I think of Easter egg. Every time I, I take my Easter egg and I open it, here's what I think. Here's the one thing that this reminds me of, Easter and Easter eggs. Here's the thing, right? So here's, here's, the, here's the thing that I think about. Who, uh, anyway, somebody hold that for me. Just, I do want to leave no, no, maybe, maybe not, maybe not. Here's the thing that I think about when I think of Easter eggs. You ready? Here it is. Ooh. He did it, he did it, did it. Look, look, look. What's in it? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. It is reg empty. Empty. It's empty. Absolutely empty. When I crack open an Easter egg, every Easter, I look inside and I see there's nothing in it. And I remember the wonderful story of how the disciples who were so frightened because Jesus had been taken and he'd been placed on the cross and he'd been killed and he'd been taken and he'd been placed in a tomb and a huge stone rolled across the tomb so that no one could enter and no one could leave. But when the disciples went that Sunday morning to find the tomb where Jesus had been laid, the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty. Empty because Jesus had risen from the dead. And because he had risen from the dead as he promised, everything that Jesus said is true. He is the one who can forgive our sins. He is the one who promises us a home, not just here, but forever and ever and ever and ever and ever with him. Guys, the tomb was empty. Because Jesus had risen from the dead. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. That's why you and I and everybody else is here this morning. The tomb was empty. Jesus is risen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus for us to pay the price that we could never pray, pay for all of the wrong things that we've done, for our turning away from you. He paid the price and he went to death, even death on a cross, and they placed him in the tomb, but death could not hold him. You raised him from death to life, and because you did that, we know you will do exactly the same for us. Thank you for the wonderful promise that we have in Jesus this Easter day. Amen. Would anybody like some more chocolate? <laughs> First hand up, Alexander. There you go. And you hold the thing, share it with your mom and dad, okay? There we go. Thank you, okay? So, boys and girls, do you want to go back to your seats? That'd be great. Back to your moms and dads. And we're going to sing together this wonderful chorus that reminds us that God is at work through all of history for this moment, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And we can trust him. Let, and Emily's going to lead us. Thank you so much, Emily. Let's praise him together.
thank you so much for leading us. It's getting quite warm, is it? Yeah, maybe we could uh, just open the door, yeah, and just let a bit of air in, that'd be great. Thank you. And let's turn together to God's Word, to 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to think about the passage together. Let's pray as we do so. Father, we thank you for your word. It is a word that brings life and life in its abundance. So give us this day attentive ears and minds and hearts and grant that by your spirit we might respond and that for your glory and honour. In Jesus' name, amen. A young boy was eating his chocolate Easter egg on the bus. And an elder ma elderly man sitting across the aisle said to him, Son, you'll mess up your teeth if you eat all that chocolate. My granda lived till he was 103, said the wee boy. <laughs> Did he eat chocolate? said the old fella. No, said the boy. He minded his own business. <laughs> Everywhere we turn, it's a mess, isn't it? Politics, economics, social care, health care, the environment, it's all a mess. The promised wonderful, shiny, new secular world isn't so wonderful or shiny anymore, is it? It has led to a crisis in almost everything, from mental health to moral confusion. So how utterly refreshing is the message of First Peter, this Resurrection Sunday. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. Kept in heaven for you. Wow. I love the beginning of this letter of Peter. It isn't instruction. It's not problem solving. He's not addressing issues. It's just worship. Just worship. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But isn't that how Peter views everything that happens now? He's a changed man. He looks at everything through the lens of this living hope. Over the last weeks, we've been thinking about this living hope, how great it is, what it is, and today we're going to finally think about what it means for us. We have this living hope. As we saw last week, this loving Jesus, this trusting Jesus, this real joy in Jesus, this living hope and we have it for a reason, for a purpose. And Peter shows us that purpose by painting a picture for us in these opening verses using three tenses, past, present, and future. So let's look at what he tells us. Let's look at what he says about the past. Do you see what he says in verse 3? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Past tense. This is what God has done for us. In his mercy, he has given us mercy. Mercy. What we don't deserve. <laughs> to, be, to be left in our transgressions and sins. That's what we deserve. But he has given us this new birth, a new life, this living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. Today is Resurrection Day. We celebrate the wonderful fact of the resurrection. The tomb was empty. Jesus had risen. And all across the world today, right across this island today, there will be sermon upon sermon upon sermon preached and all of those sermons will detail in some way the wonderful truths behind this resurrection. All of the evidence, and it is an abundance of evidence, from eyewitness accounts to early reports. 
God willing, in the next season, instead of home groups, we're, we're doing what we has become our little tradition here in First Corinthians. We're going to read a book together. We're going to read a book by Peter Williams called Why Believe the Gospels. And uh, if you'd like a copy of that book, it's not going to cost you £13. It's not going to cost you £12. It's not going to cost you £9. It's going to cost you £8.50. <laughs> and those books will be available very shortly after Easter. And it's a fantastic book, and it goes through a lot of the evidence of the, for the Gospels. But there is a substantial piece of evidence that is often overlooked. And it's this. If you believe that the resurrection didn't happen, then you have to account in some way for the change in the disciples. From fickle, frightened friends to martyrs and missionaries. What was it that lit the fuse, that fired the cannon, of all that sent the gospel to the ends of the earth? What was it? Within days of the resurrection, Stephen was martyred. And James, the brother of John, was beheaded by Herod Agrippa. All of a sudden, they were willing to die for Jesus, for what they believed. Why? What had happened? What had transformed them? Something had happened. They were changed people. They really believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. They had this living hope. A hope that completely transformed their lives. Where did that come from? Other than the fact that Jesus had risen from the dead. And here's the important thing. This Resurrection Sunday, that same living hope that faced the fury of gladiators and lions and kings and emperors, that same living hope lives in you and in me. Wow. Peter paints this picture of the past. But well, he also then paints a picture of the present. In verse 6, he reminds these Christians of their present. In all this, he says, you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Now, we all know that's true, don't we? Every one of us. We all face trials. And I would reckon every single one of us here this morning, you don't know what's behind the eyes this morning, but every single one of us is facing trials of some sort. The biggest question that I have been ever asked and I'm asked it again and again, and I think it's the most popular question that I've ever been asked, is this. When people go through trials, they say, James, am I really a Christian? Am I really a Christian? That I'm going through this. Am I really saved? Am I really saved? How do I know? Do you ever ask yourself that question? I am absolutely sure that you've asked yourself that question. We, we all have. How can you be sure that you are a Christian? Well, that's where trials of many kinds come in. Peter's saying as, as we go through trials, as we face difficulties and we continue to trust and walk with Jesus and not give up, like gold being refined in the fire, not destroyed but refined, as we keep on keeping on, then that is clear proof that we truly belong to him because that's what Christians do. They persevere. And that, that is the most valuable thing in all the world. Worth more than any gold or silver, pounds or pence, health or wealth, to know that that's true of you. Somebody says to you, how do you know that you are physically alive today? How, how do you know that you're physically alive? 
What you don't do is go to your birth certificate and say, uh, there you go, there you go, uh, born in Balamoney, true, born in Balamoney in 1960, <clears throat> there you go, there's the proof, that's nonsense, that's not proof that you are alive. What you say is, I've just taken a breath. I've just taken a breath. Every breath that you take as a Christian, every leaning that you feel towards the word of God and towards Jesus and toward his people in service, you say to yourself, I am so thankful because that's not coming from me. That's evidence that I am born again. That's evidence that I have this living hope in me. I'm trusting Jesus today. But let me, allow me to be a bit depressing for a moment. And I know you're saying no change there then, James. Okay, okay. Let me be a bit depressing for a moment. A hundred years from now, nobody is going to have a memory of you. Yes, there might well be photographs of you in an album in somebody's attic. You might even be a name on a family tree that some eager descendant will research. But a hundred years from now, no one will have a living memory of you. How many of us here knew even our grandfather's father? Everything that you have worked for, Everything that you have earned, everything that you have accumulated, everything that you have invested in and spent your hard-earned cash on, it will all be divided up and handed to someone else, and they're going to spend it. Everything. Everything. Every little jot and tittle. Sobering, isn't it? David wrote in Psalm 90, you return man to dust and say, return, O, ma o children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but, uh, but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood, they are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed, in the evening it fades and withers. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble and they are soon gone and we fly away. That's good news for resurrection day, isn't it? But look what Peter says. You don't just have a past and a present. You have a future. You have a future. Look what he says in verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Okay, a hundred years from now, no one here will remember you. You may just be a name on a headstone. But the truth is, you will not be forgotten. Not a chance. You have no abiding city here, but you have a home and you have a future because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You have this living hope. You have an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil, and never fade. Martin Luther once said, everything that is done in the world is done by hope. No farmer would sow one grain of corn if he did not hope that it would grow up and become seed. No merchant or tradesman would see himself work if he did not hope to reap benefit thereby. In other words, you wouldn't go to work this week if there was no hope of getting a reward. Hope is important in all we do. But, 
But hopes here leave us disappointed. The crops fail, the jobs lost, the class that you took, you failed it, the cancer comes back again. But that's not living hope. Living hope means that we have an inheritance that won't disappoint, it won't be destroyed, it will never perish, spoil, or fade. An inheritance is something that you don't deserve, that you haven't earned, and you could never merit. It's given to you. And this inheritance that is ours in Jesus, that we have been given, is not subject to corruption and decay as we are. Everything on earth is in a process of decaying and rusting and falling apart, but not this inheritance. Not this inheritance. Nothing on earth is perfect. And I know, folks, it's hard for us to imagine colors that will never fade, excitement that will never flag, value that will never depreciate. But then our our inheritance is not of this world. Great, says you. That's wonderful, James. That's, That's fantastic. But what does that mean for me this Easter Sunday? What does that mean for me now? That's all worth talking about, that inheritance that is ours, that is coming. But James, that's really all pie in the sky, isn't it? C.S. Lewis wrote, If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. I, I am so excited about our future together in our fellowship in the years ahead. Why? Because of this living hope. Because of this living hope. Because we think most about the world that is to come, our inheritance. And because of that, we will do so much more in this world. We will live to serve God and to serve others. We're going to close in a moment or two with the words of one of the most fantastic hymns that is sung at Easter time. The last verse says, Where the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love. This living hope is so amazing, so divine. It demands my soul, my life, my all. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, may this living hope be the lens through which we live, love, serve you, and serve others around us. May this living hope be the way in which we spend the rest of our days. Father, we pray for those who are going through trials of many kinds this day. Right across the world there are rumors of wars and wars. There is an uneasiness and anxiety right around the world. There are those who are truly suffering this day because of man's inhumanity to man. In your mercy, O Lord, hear our prayer for our world. And there are those even here in this building this morning who are truly suffering and going through unimaginable trial. Father, grant them this living hope that they might continue to trust, continue to believe, continue to cling to Jesus day by day and know the comfort and the peace that only his presence can bring. We pray today for those who doubt that they might look to you and trust in you. We pray for those who are battered and bruised Lord, bring healing. For our nation, lost in confusion, 
consumed with anxiety, overwhelmed by stress, broken and fractured. We pray for your peace. Father, give us a fresh understanding of the meaning of Jesus' resurrection. Heal the broken. Give vision to the blind. Set captives free. May we see in our day and in our generation the favour and the presence of the Lord as a light to the nations. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and close together with the words, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. May the grace of the Lord Christ Jesus and the love of the Father above and the presence and the power of the Spirit of God go with us this day and forevermore. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.